Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Crucial Conversations, a project of or a podcast of Crucial Productions. I'm Peter, and with me is I'm Kevin. As always, how's it going? I'm Kevin. I'm good. How is it going? I'm Peter. <laughs> good. I'm I'm attempting some banter at the beginning of our episode to make it more relevant and um, to our audience. I want to be like the cool kids. Yeah, because because we want to be relevant. Oh, we don't have bump music. We're already not relevant, Kevin. Oh, we're working on that, aren't we? We, well, we've we've talked about it, but we haven't settled on if we want it and if we need it. Well, so those of that, you who listen, maybe you could give us some feedback on that. And what kind of bump music? If you want bump music, yeah. When you listen to this show, this podcast, whatever this is, what kind of music comes to mind? You know what? That could be a really scary question to ask. I'm I'm kind of worried now what might happen. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but okay, so our topic today is relevance. And there <clears throat> So this this comes up in in many different contexts. We're going to talk about a couple of them today. But this idea that we need to make sure the church is relevant. That your pastor is relevant, that sermons are relevant, that uh, your worship is relevant. I mean, this comes up in, in so many different ways um, and is used in so many different ways. And we want to talk, kind of talk through what does this mean? How do we think through this? How do we process this? And we, we had a question on one of our YouTube videos a while back asking us to dig a little bit deeper on what it means to uh, take your theology to the foot of the cross and crucify it. So we're going to do that in the context of this conversation on relevance. Does that make sense, Kevin? That sounds so exciting. <laughs> if we had bump music going right now, like while I'm talking, it would actually sound more exciting. We'd be like motivated and excited to discuss this. I think we needed some electronica or something like that. <laughs> I'm not really into electronica. Do you like electronica stuff? I only like one electronica band that I know of. Yeah. I I mean, there might be some that I like and I didn't realize that I actually did, but I don't go out and buy any electronica anything, nor do I search for it on YouTube. I think we've lost both listeners at this point. I know. We're no longer relevant. Although I mentioned YouTube and YouTube is cool. So the, the purchasing of music if we meant something physical is not relevant and we lost people at that point. That's so, true. Yeah. Okay. Kevin, let's start off with uh, church has to be relevant. Go. Okay. Well, I think there's a couple issues at hand and the first is from what vantage point are you defining relevance? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is, that the church is relevant by definition. So I don't think we're actually talking about the ontological or the ex existential or the existence kind of idea of the church being relevant because the church is relevant. Um, but what we're talking about is it seems to me in these, in these conversations, what people are asserting is that the church should work to be relevant to people's lives for the purpose of attracting those people to the church or to the pastor or to the preaching or something like that. Uh, attracting or retaining would be another aspect of it. But ba yeah, basically the idea that whatever's going on in this church, it's not relevant. People don't want to be here because they don't think it applies to them. And so we have to change things, do things differently to convince them that they do want to be here. Is that a good way of putting it? Yeah, exactly. So there's something that the church needs to do to attract people, retain people, um, make them want to be there or something like that. And the word that has become the common way to address that is that we need to be relevant. We need to, we can't be just talking about old things or we can't be dressed like old people or something like that. We need to be relevant to today's world. We need to meet the people where they're at those kinds of phrases. Now, before I, I think, I don't know if we've tipped our hand already, but it's people probably assume that we're thinking this is a bad thing that you, you don't need to do this, but there, there are positive ways 
to look at this. Like you, we can't just completely throw out the word and say this word and anything that comes along with it is total trash. Just ignore it. And anybody saying it is selling something. Um, so too bad princess. Did you get that? Life reference? is pain. There we go. So it's a reference. Kevin gets. Yes. Not only, not only is it a interesting idea, but a lot of people actually go to a scripture passage to, to say that this is something that we should be doing. So in first Corinthians chapter nine, verse 22, Paul says to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Mm. And so a lot of people see there, Paul using himself as an example and saying that we should do whatever it takes to bring the gospel to people. So if they are, you know, into drinking coffee, then we should drink coffee with them. If they are into watching sports, then maybe we should have a Super Bowl party where we can, you know, share the gospel during the Super Bowl or something. And so people have said this verse kind of tells the church or allows the church the op- option or the necessity even of being relevant for the goal of sharing the gospel. I think I've also heard, I'm, I was trying to find it. I think it's in Matthew. You can tell me where it is. The verse about you don't put new wine into old wine skins. Right. Good. That's in Matthew. And, and that's, and that's another verse that sometimes gets used here where it's like, well, you need, we want to have new converts. And if you want new or new people come into your church, whether it's new converts or not, if you want new people come into your church, you have to do new things to attract new people. Um, that's part of this relevance relevance conversation as well yeah and the the real question is you know what's the goal and how to achieve it and i know that doesn't sound like christian talk and it really isn't it's secular <laughs> talk but we've, we've this moved conversation into the... is is really kind of motivated by that kind of thinking yeah, th- this is a business conversation in so- in one sense. It's a, it's almost a transactional kind of conversation. Yeah. And the goal, which I think is is the laudable part of this discussion often is that the people who talk this way really want more people to hear the good news about Jesus. Yes. And that is something that we're all in favor of. I'm trying to remember if we've we've actually discussed that aspect of it before, but it is, it is going to be much more helpful in having this conversation with somebody when you realize that the reason they want things done differently is because they do care about Jesus being proclaimed and people hearing about Jesus and coming to faith and believing in him. So right away... E- even if we majorly disagree with how that might happen, yeah, recognize that's why they're saying it in the first place. And and affirm that that we agree that this is this is something that the church is concerned about. the The New Testament is quite clear that this news is for all people, and it's good. So, if someone says, "Well, you know, I just really want my whatever, my neighbor, my friend, my cousin, whoever, to hear the good news," and I and I just whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes for them to to know about the love of Jesus or to be mm-hmm. saved or whatever word they used. I think at that point we say, yes, that's right. We, we have the same goal in mind. We want the gospel of Jesus Christ to have its effect on a sinner's life and to result in that sinner receiving forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life because of what Christ has done. We, we can totally rejoice in that goal and, and really join together as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, yes, this is, this is the good news we have. And it's a good news that, is to be shared and we want to share it. Mm -hmm. So, so I think if you, if you approach a conversation with somebody from that point of view, you right away say, you know, I agree with your goal. I agree with the idea that we're trying to achieve here. And, you know, it's not a business model. We're not going to do something to achieve the goal, but, but the the idea (laughs) is that as Paul says here, that I might, by all means, I might save some. So he actually does make it a transactional kind of thing. He's, he's going to do everything in his power to present the gospel to as many people as possible. 
And as it says in the book of Acts, whomever's heart the Lord prepares to hear that word will be saved. And so we kind of put in the Lord's hands. But from our point of view, what can I do? What can yeah. I do to get this message to as many people as possible? Um, to be totally blunt, we're podcasting. <laughs> yeah, that's actually our motivation for doing this. So and the whole series on Christology is because we want people to know who Jesus is. And to trust in him for salvation. I mean, yeah. sorry, hidden agenda here. <laughs> we want you to know that God loves you. And he sent his son to die for you and to rise again. And, and that the result of that is you have forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his name. Sorry. I think we've managed to say that in every episode. That's so actually I, what we, we're all about. We right? didn't so, hide our agenda very well, Kevin. <laughs> exactly. So if someone comes to me and says, you need to be relevant in order to spread the gospel, there's actually a lot of that we can say, absolutely. So if it means plugging microphones into a computer and uploading that to the internet so that people can listen to it while they're on their morning run. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that is a, that is a way to use technology and the gifts that God has given certain people, obviously not us to, <laughs> to do that in a way that maybe the spirit works through that to bring them to a, a local congregation where they, they receive word and sacrament ministry on a regular basis. Right. Yeah. Maybe it, it drives people to read their holy scriptures with their with their family and daily devotions, and and that family goes to church every Sunday and and to hear word and receive the sacraments from their pastor. That's what we're getting at, right? So yeah. all of this, we say absolutely, and and there's a lot of things that we can discuss in this. Now, the the place where I would caution us, though, and and maybe turn the conversation a little bit is when we say the church needs to be relevant to the world. We're kind of establishing which of the two things, church or world, is the proper thing and which one must be changed. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I, when the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying, and when this topic comes up, it always comes up in a particular context, usually with a reference to the thing that needs to be changed right up front. So, uh, what one example is, um, well, pastors who wear vestments, so the the robes that pastors wear in church, whether it's a white one, whether it's a black one, whether it's a big old poncho over top of a white one, I'm intentionally not using the proper words for these. Yeah, Liturgical Nazis can go nuts. That's fine. <laughs> At least I didn't say dress. Some people yeah. will go people that far. Dress. Yeah. Um, but, but the but different things and all, all that, and it's like, that's not relevant. The history I don't know of the what church. that means. Yeah. The history so of the, the church is that pastors dress a certain way when leading worship. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the history of the church going back, and we can argue about when this all started, but that pastors even wear certain clothing when they're not leading worship. And some people say, well, that's all old or that's traditional, but that's not relevant to me. I don't, I'm not used to going to a place and listening to a guy in a white robe talk at me for 20 minutes from a a pulpit made of wood, right? That's not yeah, relevant that's, to me. That's, that's not relevant to my life. I can't right. relate to that at I all. I can't relate to that. And, and neither can anybody else that I know. I mean, that's yeah. just not a normal occurrence. Yep. So so the charge is then in order to get the gospel into more people's ears, we don't, you know, the gospel is not more effective if I say it while I'm wearing a robe versus wearing a, a golf shirt and jeans, right? Skinny jeans. If you've ever seen me in skinny jeans, you would know it'd be less effective if I was wearing skinny <laughs> jeans. So, so that's just kind of right out there. You There's know? nothing skinny that's why about we're podcasting me. and not video whatevering. Right? Yeah, we did have somebody request that we have video on us while we do this. I was like, oh, that's yeah, that'd that's be why the this end is of the podcast. Show. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, that's kind of the issue. Is they're saying, okay, in order to get more people, the pastor needs to change to look more like the world so that the people of the world will listen to the pastor speak. And That's I understand, a, I understand the sentiment. I understand yeah, yeah. that, you know, if you walk up in the middle of a crowd and you look like a crazy person, actually they might listen to you more because you're crazy, but, but at least it's initially hard for them to trust you immediately. And it's hard for them to relate to you immediately. So I understand the concern, but, but here's how I want to encourage us to look at this is that, and, and just, you know, just stick with me for a second. Watch for changes. Try to keep up. <laughs> Is that when God talks about himself in the context of world religions, 
And that actually does happen in the Bible where God describes himself in the context of other idols. So mm-hmm. false gods that other nations have invented or other peoples are worshiping. And God actually describes himself. And he says, you know, they're neat. They're kind of fun. But I created the world. And I know people are really attached to their other gods. Mm-hmm. But I actually made the stuff that the people used to make those gods. Yeah. And I'm the God that can speak. I'm the God that can listen. And I'm the God who knows the past and knows the future. Those gods were made by humans, were, are moved around by humans. They're entirely mute. And they, they can't tell you the past nor the future. The only past they know is the past that you know. And they don't know anything about the future. And neither do you. <laughs> so... And I know that that's kind of a, a polemic and that's a different way to go. But I, the, the point I'm making is that. Well, but you're actually, you're, it's not a direct quote of scripture, but I'm trying to remember where, where is this? Is Habakkuk, I think. Talks no, it's in Isaiah. This? It's is actually it Isaiah? in Isaiah okay. that he talks this way. And if you want to read it, it's, it's, it's really throughout Isaiah 40 to 55 that he, he goes through this. Yeah. Um, so what, what this means for us in this conversation is that. By definition, the God who created the world is relevant to the world. And I think that's an important thing to start at is that we are not seeking to make God relevant because God is relevant. He created all of us. He knit us together in our mother's wombs. He formed us. He is the one who keeps the world spinning, literally. He is the one who provides daily bread, both for the believer and the unbeliever. So we don't need to work to make God relevant. By virtue of who he is and what he's done, he's he's relevant. That's the way it works. (laughs) And that's also true for Jesus. Jesus died for sinners. Well, every single person ever born of woman is a sinner. Yeah. So Jesus' death and resurrection is, is relevant to them. Right. And and since every person faces death as a reality, Jesus' resurrection is the most relevant conversation we can have to a person who's facing imminent death. The promise of the defeat of death, the promise of eternal life is the most relevant topic we could possibly discuss with anybody. I mean, just think this through. We are so germophobic right now in our society. We're so scared of every disease in the world because we think it might kill us. Especially the coronavirus right now. Yeah, I mean, we have coronavirus going on right now. And and the real fear behind that is the fear of death. And we have, we know the God who has defeated death. We know the one who has died and on the third day was raised not just in our minds, not just in our hearts. He physically rose from the dead and he's still alive today and he lives and he reigns unto all eternity. You can't get any more relevant than that. Okay. So there are two, two things that, that come to mind as we talk through this first is how, how you've approached this relevance question, because what you've done, which is what we try to do here at crucial productions uh, every time is Okay, let's talk about how Jesus is relevant. Let's move the conversation in that direction. I started us off on, you know, how we do church and what the pastor wears, and you moved us straight to Jesus. So that's the first thing that hopefully we're modeling or you're modeling here is that that's the actual, if we're talking about relevance, that's the actual conversation. But yes. what, what happens more often than not, the second thing I want to say is, You'll you'll either the the conversation remains on what the pastor wears, and then it's an argument about whether if if it if it comes to Jesus at all, it's whether what the pastor wears points to Jesus, and then it's simply a subjective back and forth of yes, I think it does. No, I think it doesn't. Um, and and I think those those who would defend the pastor's wearing the more formal robes and the poncho. I'm just going to say poncho for this episode. That's people are going to have to deal with it. Um, (laughs) Still 
defend it as that's relevant. And they simply try and convince the other person that, no, it really is relevant. You just have to see how it actually is relevant. Uh, I've heard the argument made that way, which is still a discussion of the clothing. Um, Okay. So how do you make this turn? So, so, I mean, you and I can do this right now because you just tell me, Peter, we're going to talk about this now. But if I'm actually in this conversation with somebody and the argument is about what the pastor wears, how do I make that turn? Well, I think the first thing we do is, is and I say this a lot when I talk to people about apologetics or defending the faith or how to talk about the faith is don't concede the ground. Don't give in to their argument. And I don't mean that mean way. I mean, keep your wits about you and remember what we just went over is that the gospel is relevant. Start there. Start with God being relevant because that really does help drive the conversation forward. So what happens, you say, well, okay, so I agree with all that. Jesus is relevant. God is relevant. That kind of makes sense. Now, what I'm saying is all you churchy robe people and all this churchy worship type stuff or the or the even the church itself is Don't driving the people ponchos. away from that gospel. <laughs> What's that? Don't forget the ponchos. And the ponchos, it's driving people away from the gospel because you're kind of putting up a barrier they have to get through in order to hear the gospel because they're so freaked out by the way you look or the songs you sing or whatever, right? It's so I distracting. Just want some good old rock and roll, and then I'll <laughs> hear the gospel. And 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 this is really interesting because Peter, you can actually speak to this. Do you have to be sitting in pews in a building listening to a guy in a robe in order for it to be legitimately church? I hope not. Because you, you, you grew up in... I grew up in Africa. <laughs> where? I, re- I remember church services outside underneath a tree. Right. And I've actually visited a Lutheran yeah. church in fellowship with the LCMS that was started underneath a tree. They now have a church building, but their first 10 years of existence, they worshiped under a tree and they're Lutherans. And in those economies, you simply don't have money for any sort of vestment. So to require that of your pastors in order to say this is church, well, now you can't have church because you simply don't have the funding to do it, too. Right. <laughs> so so we are not saying in an absolute sense that the only way the gospel can be spread or preached or proclaimed is through the way that the Western liturgy vests their pastors or the Eastern liturgy. Yeah. Right. That we're not, we are not saying the clothing is what makes the gospel effective or relevant or even relevant or non-relevant since since that's what we're talking about today. (laughs) So, well, but, but I don't want to get to relevance yet. We're talking about, okay, sorry. Yes. So what happens then is, is we are, we are not actually saying to this person, this conversation that there's only one way to dress to spread the gospel. Right. And then, then I would say to them, are you saying there's only one way to dress to spread the gospel? Mm. Does it have to be skinny jeans? Does it have to be what's popular today? Yeah. And I think the, the obvious answer is no, no, I can't say that. I can't say that what I wear, I was gonna say, or don't wear, but I don't know if I'm going on that path. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. Actually, wear. D- d- yeah, wear the, don't, the don't wear is actually going to have a Yeah, that actually could impact. have a problem here. Yeah, don't do but, that. But I think everyone would agree that, that what a person wears is not the point of the effectiveness of the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit working through the power of the word to change hearts, according to scripture, right? That's what scripture says. Faith comes by what, hearing. It doesn't say yeah. faith comes by the way you dress. That's actually what, in Hamlet. But that's a different that's a different story altogether. <laughs> Which is good because the way we dress changes every few years or so. And so if if the efficacy of the gospel is in any way tied to fashion, well, uh-oh. we're constantly, yeah, that's, uh-oh, we got a serious so, problem. So now what we've done is we've just moved the conversation, Peter just did it for us effectively, is we've moved the conversation to the reality that we are not doing this in isolation. Yeah. I am not the first person to open the Bible and teach it. And what we're actually doing is we live in the life of the church, right? And that church goes Mm -hmm. back to 
Adam. Ah. Uh, All the yeah. people of God. Yep. So one of yep. the things that we're going to do is we're going to say, how has the church looked at this issue in the past? What has the church done? How has the church looked at relevancy, um, spreading the gospel, calling unbelievers to faith? What what has the church done? And the first place we look to answer that question is? The Bible. The Bible. We look to the <laughs> scriptures themselves and see what was the methodology for the, the, the word of God being spread. And I was going to say Jesus, but I didn't think that was actually the right yeah. answer. So I went well, with we look at Jesus. Sunday school answer number two, the Bible. But we're going to specifically now we're looking at the church spreading the gospel of Jesus. So we're going to look at how the church did yeah. that. And, and what you find out, and we'll just be blunt about this. Um, unless we get accused of either, either direction, but, but the Bible <laughs> doesn't mention any of these things. We have no idea what the apostles wore. It doesn't say, you know, and Peter actually, it does talk about Peter getting dressed one place, but that's because he was, he had removed his clothes because he was fishing. So he puts them on. Right. Um, but it doesn't say, you know, before Peter preached in Acts two at the day of Pentecost, he went and put on his liturgical vestments, you know, <laughs> and, and his miter and crook and went out. He found an ephod. It doesn't it say that. Now we do have priestly garments in the old Testament, that were very specifically designed by God so that everyone know who the priest was and what their job was. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And very, very clear. And that, and that, that happens throughout the old Testament where the ephod and the, and even some of the vestments are mentioned. We had a turban and all kinds of weird things going on. Right. Right. But what we don't have in the new Testament, any prescription for that, none. Well, and also remember that when I said the efficacy of the gospel is not tied to fashion, it's also not tied to fashion from 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago or anywhere in between as we're talking about these other things because I think that's also an error that we sometimes slip into, which is, okay, yeah, I understand that it's not the skinny jeans, but if you're not wearing that robe, I'm not sure you're actually a pastor. And we're, yeah, and, we're and making the so same, same problem there. <laughs> we actually haven't answered the question yet because we're still getting to the way to answer it. Yes. Right? Because yeah. Because – there are so many errors in, the answer, in answering this question that it's, it's actually difficult to get to the right answer. So what we want to look at is our answer can't be inconsistent with the history of the Orthodox Church. And I don't mean Orthodox as an Eastern Orthodox. I mean the, the church that has continued to teach the truth of Christ as revealed in Holy Scriptures. Right. Yeah. So you think of the, the creedal church. Right. The churches that confess the Nicene, the Apostles, and the Athanasian creeds. Mm -hmm. Right. For us as Lutherans, you'd say the true Orthodox Church is those who confess the faith um, as expressed in the scriptures and the, and the Lutheran confessions. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So so we're looking at the history of, of the church that is truly confessing Christ. Okay. And you say, what have they done in this issue? What? How have they looked at it? How have they addressed it? And, and I think what you'll find out is that what the church does not do is seek a way to attract society by becoming like society. Yeah. <laughs> what the church does is they attract society by trying to be like Christ. Yeah. Like Jesus. And this is the key. This is the key. If you think that sinners will be attracted to the gospel because we look like them, that is a flawed view of the gospel. And it's the a gospel flawed view is of sinners. not. What's that? And it's a flawed view of sinners. And it's a flawed view of sinners. Yeah. Because the gospel is not that God loves you as you are. Because as you are is directly leading you to hell. And and what we know from Romans is that no sinner is looking for the gospel. Right, but we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't actually gotten there yet. But uh, I keep jumping make, ahead of you. <laughs> I know, don't do that. If we make the church relevant to the world, what we're actually saying is God likes you as you are. Hmm. But that's not good. We don't want a God who leaves us as we are because we have a problem that we need solved. We don't we don't need a pat on the head. We need someone to kill death for us. We need someone to forgive our sins. We need someone to rescue us from the evil that we have done. Okay, I was going to say, I don't know that churches actually are saying 
God loves you as you are. But then I realized, wait, no, there are entire marketing campaigns. Yes, that, that actually say that. Come as you are. In. Yeah. So I, 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 I was like, oh, wait. And this no, is something that I've actually a straw man. They actually do that. <laughs> they actually do. Yes. And I've actually yeah. heard this from somebody who was rescued from a lifestyle. And he actually said that he didn't, he didn't hear the gospel until someone told him that God loves you enough to rescue you from your situation, to change you, to rescue you from death, not leave you in it not leave yeah. you in your sin, but God loves you enough to get you out of your sin. And this is part of the relevancy issue, issue is, I don't want a church that looks like the Super Bowl. I don't, because <laughs> there is no salvation there. Given the halftime show this year, that'd be really awkward. That'd be really bad. Yeah, no. So we actually need a church that is relevant to us in the way that God does something about our sin problem in, yeah. in that God does something about our death problem. And what he does is he takes us out of our sin. He takes us out of death. He conquers our sin. He calls us out of our evil. And what it says in Colossians is he transfers us from darkness to the kingdom of light. I need to be transferred. I don't need my church to be like everything else in my life. Everything else in my life is actually the problem. I need the church to be holy, set apart, different. Yeah. And, and when you look at the history of the church, when the church spread, when the church grows by leaps and bounds, it's when it is persecuted, when it is anything but popular. Even in the book of Acts, Look, look what it says. It says that when they first gathered, people were scared. They were scared to join them. Well, because they had people like Paul going around killing them. And yeah, and then some other things were going on. But what <laughs> happened was the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Yeah. And, and what we want to do in this issue is we want to say, we don't want to make the church purposefully hard to join or purposely so weird that it doesn't interact with sinners lives, but we do want the church to be different than sinful existence. And that's where you really need to do your research into the history of the church and how the church has wrestled with this in the past. And then also I really encourage you to ask your pastor about the decisions made for what the pastors wear on Sunday morning for and, and, and think this through for a second, what your sanctuary looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sanctuary is a technical term in the Lutheran church. That's where worship actually occurs. So that's where you go in to hear the word and receive the sacraments. That's the sanctuary or the, or the nave. Okay. Now your narthex, which is kind of your, your, um, what would you call it? That's where we gather for coffee. That's your entryway, your cat, your <laughs> your coffee area. That might look like someone's old living room or your grandma's living room. You know, thinking yeah. of your church, Peter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and that's it's, fine it's that's, because that's kind of where we have coffee. But but even yep. look at that. If you look at the way your church is designed, the sanctuary where the worship actually occurs looks different. Yeah, because what happens there is different. And, and that's where I would like to, to encourage this conversation to move is that the relevant question is answered in Christ with an affirmative yes. God is relevant to every single person because Christ has come to die for the sins of every single sinner and gives to every single person who believes in him eternal life through his death and resurrection. That's, that's relevant to every one of us who sins and has to die. Every one of us, no questions asked, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't even get that, you just simply go back to, well, God created the world. So by definition, he's relevant. But, but the conversation of then how does the church communicate this best? I, I really encourage the conversation to go in the, in the direction of, we don't want to communicate to the world that we are you just with hymnals. <laughs> and robes. And robes. Or, or we're just like you. But I listen to a guy that stands on a stage and, you know, is entertaining for half an hour with skinny jeans. No, I want and to communicate rock to the world. Slightly less cool. Yeah, slightly less cool. <laughs> I want to communicate to the world 
that Christ transforms us. Right? The message of baptism is not a simple washing to remove a little bit of dirt you got on you. It's actually a death and resurrection issue. See, that's not something I want to say, well, I look just like you and talk just like you, so I'm cool, so you'll come listen to this message. No, I am walking into a sinner's life and saying, you need to die to sin and rise with Christ. There's no way to make that cool to a sinner. Can I say, is this another way of saying it, that I want I want you to come because I want you to see that you're going to get something here that you can't get anywhere else. Exactly. It, That's exactly it. And if it, it looks, if it looks like everywhere else, why would you think that you can get something here that you can't get anywhere else? But if, if it, it looks, sounds like anywhere else. Yeah. If it looks, if it sounds, if it feels, whatever we want to add to that, like anywhere else. I, it's okay to assume that you're going to get what you get everywhere else. But if it's now, different. So let's be clear. Just yeah. looking different isn't the gospel either. Right. I've been to plenty of churches where the pastor is all dressed up like a liturgical pastor and the liturgy was done correctly and the hymns were traditional hymns. And I've said after the sermon, well, I might as well have gone somewhere else because that didn't have anything to do with Jesus. So right. again, it is the, the message that we are preaching and teaching and proclaiming is specifically Christ and him crucified. So we're assuming in all this that the message that's spoken is an orthodox method. method message. Once again, going back to the church underneath the tree, that's, yeah. That, that it was Christ and him crucified. Yeah. What am I makes hearing? That what church. There. Yeah. And, and so that's the point is we're not saying vestments make it church. We're not saying skinny jeans negate the gospel. What we're saying is the desire to be relevant is really to be brought to the way you proclaim Christ to a sinner's life, not the way the church should change to attract sinners. Yeah. So when I say I want to be relevant, that, that can be a good thing and say, you know, if I'm speaking to an audience that is very academic, well, then I'm going to pre- present the gospel in a way that I think academics would understand it. If I'm talking to a bunch of, you know, five-year-olds, I'm probably not going to explain a whole bunch of academic theology. I'm probably not going to go over the gainus myostaticum to them, although I might <laughs> have been fun. Um, but I'm probably going to make it very simple. I'm probably going to speak in, in words they can understand. Um and those, so, so in that and, way, and if, we, and if you're in America and if you're here in the United States, you're probably going to do it in English, not in French. Exactly. So that's, that's one way the church is relevant. And we affirm that is a good thing is yeah. we don't demand you learn Latin or German or Greek in order to hear the gospel. We adjust, we say, okay, we're going to speak in English. So, so mm-hmm. even the Bibles we read in church is a relevant adjustment. So we say, we're going to read this Bible in church. In the, if you go to an LCMS congregation, we've pretty much adopted the ESV, right? Mm-hmm. Because our publishing house, Concordia Publishing House, uh, uses that in their publications. We love CPH, by the way. Go to CPH, get your stuff. They're good, they're good people over there. Yeah, lots of good stuff over there. Yeah, great stuff. So go check out their, their website and catalog. Um, so that's, that's a relevant move, right? We're not reading the, the Bible in Greek and Hebrew like it was originally written. We're, right. we're doing it in a way that people can hear it. So in that way, we, we do things that are relevant. And, and guess what? When you look at the history of the church, that's something they have said is a good idea to do. Mm-hmm. So that, that's why this is such a difficult question because there, there are always things that you say, yeah, that would make sense to do that. But there are other things to say, but don't make the church like the world. Okay. And you'll even have this in translations. You'll have some translations are like, um, you know, it's the, it's the Valley girl translation. I'm dating (laughs) myself, right? That was like 700 years ago. Yeah. And they, and it's not actually a translation. It's more of a way to make the Bible sound cool. Right. Well, that's probably not the best idea. But making making sure a translation is in is in readable and understandable English is probably a good idea. So it is sometimes a little bit difficult to measure, you know, what's right and wrong in this. And that's why I encourage the conversation in the context of your pastor, in the context of your congregation and how they've looked at these issues. 
um, what are the things that you've done to invite the community in? But what are the decisions you've made to not go so far as to look like your community in some ways? I really want my church to be a place that I can walk into and it is not the same as the rest of my life. I want it to be the place that I know I'm going to go hear Christ and him crucified every time I'm in that building. It's a, it's a refuge for us when we go there. And, yeah. and one of the reasons just, just to maybe answer a quick question, then we'll go is one <laughs> of the reasons our pastors do wear vestments is because we want it to be clear that our pastor is there to proclaim Christ, not to, to point to himself. So the vestments are actually not a way to say, oh, look at our pastor, he's wearing a dress, but it's actually a way to hide the pastor and say, the important thing you see up here is the called and ordained office of preaching the word and administering the sacraments. And it's important to actually, as you said, say that and to teach that, because if we're going to have the crucial conversation about Christ and pointing people to Christ, we actually have to teach people that that's what we're doing, because these things are not obvious in and of themselves as if, oh, he's wearing a robe. That's clearly about Jesus. You right. actually have to have this conversation. And so we encourage, you know, as a father, I teach this to my kids. I, I talk them through this. We don't just let it happen as if, oh, they'll get it. I mean, it's obvious. Everybody knows this. Let's actually have this conversation about how these things can point to Christ as opposed to just assuming, well, obviously they do. And if, and, and one more thing, if you're having this conversation with somebody, don't let it become an argument. Keep reaffirming that Christ is really the object of all of this. And, and if they're saying, Hey, I'm just, I'm just trying to find a way to spread the gospel. I'm an unbelieving friend say you agree with that and, and you appreciate yeah. that about them and you, and Affirm you trust that. that that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. So keep driving this conversation to Christ and him crucified. Keep driving this conversation to, to God is relevant in Christ. And we agree that that's the message that, that everyone needs to hear. And that is the crucial conversation. We'll see you guys next time. See ya.